After playing Persona 5 Royal on Merciless with only Joker and a single Mandrake, it would seem like these runs couldn't get any more difficult. Well, prepare yourselves for perhaps the most brutal run yet! Today on RPG Challenge Runs, we ask ourselves, can you be Persona 3 portable with only a single angel? As always, we're on the hardest difficulty, this time called Maniac, and we're playing solo as the female protagonist. Anytime we're forced to have teammates, they may only guard and cannot be healed, revived, buffed, etc. We're allowed to use other personas for fusions and social link boosts, but in battle we may only use Angel. Finally, no glitches, hacks, mods, etc. No story spoilers because the game recently got remastered, but obviously we will be showing bosses, characters and locations. Let's go. We name ourselves Charlie. And a quick reminder that in this version of Persona 3, you control the character by moving this pink circle around the 2D background while interacting with these icons. Not ideal, but it is what it is. Every month during the full moon, we will be fighting a main story boss, whereas during our free time, we're able to explore a tower named Tartarus while fighting mini bosses all the way up. We soon encounter our first shadow. Appreciate some top tier next gen remastered quality audio. Here goes. And encounter our first battle against these two cowardly Myers. We don't have access to Angel yet, and therefore we're not allowed to summon our persona, but thankfully Charlie here is frighteningly proficient with a halberd, which is a totally normal skill for a teenager to possess. Bruh, it's a naganata. Don't care. We drop to 17 HP as the last one falls. <laughs> that was pretty close. We're now level 3 and unlock our first social link as a reward. More on these things a bit later because I have a lot to talk about. Time for Tartarus. The first visit here is basically a scripted tutorial disguised as real exploration, but to be honest it does a really good job at teaching you how the game works without taking 5 hours to do so. As a Brucey bonus, more experienced players have the option to skip Mitsuru's waffling and get straight to the action. We're forced to have Yukari and Junpei on the team for now, so we just keep them guarding. Enemies seem pretty easy, so long as we hit them from behind to trigger a player advantage. It's worth noting that on Maniac difficulty, enemies apparently have a better field of view, and can therefore ambush you much easier, so you have to be pretty much directly behind them when you strike, like 180 degrees. In the battle against three enemies though, both of our teammates fall, and it looks like we're going to be next. We have no healing items yet. Thankfully, the game prevents these tutorial enemies from killing us by making them seem bewildered. Nice! We just mop up and leave. There's nothing more that we can do here today, especially since we're still only level 3 and we won't be able to fuse Angel until level 4. Back in the daily life portion, we go to the police station to buy better equipment and weapons. Yep, actual weaponry is being sold to the general public from a police station. <laughs> oh, I suppose it's best not to ask too many questions about what the hell is happening here. We visit the cinema, work part time at a coffee shop and it's back into Tartarus. This is the first proper non-tutorial section of the game and since party members can now be removed, run failure is now an ever looming threat. The first battle begins and we still don't have Angel, so our only options are to attack, guard or use items. These guys use Aggie for massive damage, so we're having to burn through almost all of our healing items. A reminder that these guys are some of the weakest enemies in the entire game, which just goes to show how crazy difficult this is going to be. Somehow though, we make it through to the other side. That was a difficult battle. I agree. <laughs> well, we made it to level 4 and can now fuse our Angel. Welcome to the team, friend. We were forced to take the Bash skill since Angel can't inherit the fire skill Aggie, but thankfully she already knows the wind spell Garu, giving us a small slice of elemental coverage. Enemies are much easier now, but death is still an ever-present risk if one of them gets the jump on us. We have to treat exploration like we're playing a Metal Gear Solid game and keep a keen eye on that minimap. While we complete some battles, let's have a look at the persona that's going to, hopefully, carry us to victory. As a low level persona, Angel's stats are pretty terrible and she's weak to dark, leaving us vulnerable to one-shot Mudo skills. 
She does resist light which seems great but not many enemies have access to light skills in the first place and the fact that Angel has no other resistances means we're forced to tank full damage on every enemy attack. Patra and Charmdy are just useless skills that can be replaced with items. Hammer and Sukakaja are kinda meh and obviously Garu will be only effective in the early game. It's the kind of persona that looks really strong at first, but when you break it down, it's actually super weak. I'm really worried about what the mid and end game will look like. Before long, Angel levels up and gives us a skill card as a thank you. We'll soon be able to passively level up other personas by using growth skills, allowing us to access gifted skill cards and other items from personas that sit idle in our stock. I really like this system, it incentivizes casual players to switch up their personas and try to obtain as many gifts as possible. Some enemies are starting to flee from us. Oh, they're so cute, bless them. So let's try the very first mini boss trio blocking floor 5. It's worth noting that all mini bosses must be defeated in order to complete this game, so none of them are optional. These three Venus Eagles are weak to piercing, which is a type of physical damage that we don't yet have access to. They also nullify all wind damage, meaning our Garu is useless. We have to start using up the limited Cadenza items from Mitsuru, which each restore 50% HP and give a 3 turn buff to evasion and accuracy. Despite this, we're dead in under a minute. Yep, we died to the easiest mini boss in the entire game, and it wasn't even close. Plus, on Maniac difficulty, every death sends you straight back to the title screen and forces you to reload your save file. There's only one thing for it. We need to grind some more. While farming enemies, we come across our very first Golden Shadow, a rare enemy that drops an item that's worth a heck of a lot of cash. We have to get the jump on it though, because if it spots us, it'll just teleport out of there. Come on, turn around. Yes, alright, let's go. Turn one and... Oh, it fled instantly. Lovely. Bruh. We linger around here a little bit too long, spawning in the endgame Reaper boss. Okay, this is fine. Stay calm and walk away. <laughs> How do you like that invisible wall, you floaty cloaked git? After more leveling up, we're lucky enough to find a second golden shadow. Okay, be quiet everyone, we got it this time. Alright, let's go! Wait, are you actually kidding me? Ugh. Right, I swear this is personal now. My ultimate mission is to beat one of these bloody things. At level 10, we're back with the mini boss trio. You might think that things would be significantly easier now, but nope, can't even kill a single one. Ouch. We'd level up again and come back. This time, we're going to try using Bash more. It costs us some of our HP to use, but it deals almost double the damage. The results, well, still not happening. <laughs> right. Is this entire game going to be like this? I swear some of you watching right now will just be enjoying my misery way too much. <laughs> After even more grinding, we're back at level 12 with Angel at 9. We could have just left Tartarus for another day, but I'm determined to get past these guys. Somehow we've managed to take out the first bird. Nice. We've used up all of our healing items, but the second bird goes down soon afterwards. It's now a 1v1, Charlie versus the final bird, and we have no way of healing ourselves. Come on, just need a lucky critical. Are you serious? Oh, come on, it was down to like 20% health. After that, well, <laughs> check this out. Endless deaths and a third golden shadow escapes from us. What is going on in this game? But just as all hope seems lost, 17 attempts later we have this run. We go all in with Bash, keep using cadenzas for HP and evasion, and although we do miss a few shots, the birds also seem to be getting really bad RNG because they're missing a lot too, causing them to fall down. We keep bashing downed enemies, dealing over 60 damage in most cases, and we're soon back at the final 1v1 stage, but we're out of healing items again. This could go either way. 
Thankfully though, yep, a very lucky late fight crit knocks the thing down, granting us the extra turn needed to take it out. Job done. Oh. You have the potential to grow even stronger. Damn right. Now give me that loot. Nice. Beaching? Ah, oh, that's pretty decent. Hey, let's push our luck and go straight for the floor 10 mini boss. What could possibly go wrong? Well, within seconds we're panicked, electrocuted, burned and frozen out of there. Holy Jesus. Let's uh let's head back for now. Back in school and we take advantage of our tiredness from all the shadow killing shenanigans by visiting this shady guy in the nurse's office and drink his quart medicine. It doesn't help our tiredness but it does give us a nice big courage boost without using up a time slot. After joining the tennis club to begin the chariot social link, we spend more money at the arcade and see this all important message. You're still tired. This sounds like a bad thing, but allows us to drink even more dodgy medicine the next day. Tiredness randomly wears off after one to four days, but for this run, we'll need to be repeatedly saving and reloading the game to ensure we stay tired and sick for as long as possible after each dark hour visit, until we have max courage that is. We grab a persimmon tree leaf to unlock the Hierophant social link, spend more money at the arcade, and oh, oh we're not tired anymore. Better reload the last save file. Second time around, ah, still not tired. Okay, third attempt, come on. Yes, we've caught COVID, let's go. After a quick coffee shop visit, we thankfully keep our illness and can therefore drink yet another dose of the good stuff. I think by this point, our protagonist has a serious addiction problem. We grab some equipment upgrades and unlock another social link. But this isn't Persona 5. Why are you bothering with social links in a game where they provide no passive bonuses? I hear you asking. Well, insightful viewer whose question I just invented to make a point, you will find out later. Yes, I promise there is a reason that we're not just buffing Angel stats in the arcade right now. Hold your horses, amigo. We'll get to it. We go on a date with Theodore, which feels a bit uncomfortable, and we let him sip our muscle drink for an Angora sweater. This is a fantastic new armor, which is offering 25% more defense and plus 30 to our max SP. Nice! It's Sunday, so we buy whatever crap this guy's selling on the TV. To be fair, later in the game there will be some good stuff here, so we'll just have to remember to check it out each week. After spending 30 grand on medicine, yeah, I don't think we're going to run out anytime soon, it's back into Tartarus. Against regular enemies, we're now dealing massive damage, one-shotting most low floor enemies. Nice. Ooh, another golden shadow. What is this, the fourth one now? We got this. Come on. No, or maybe no. Oh, for God's sake. Back to floor 10 mini boss trio. Attempt one. Uh, nope. Attempt two. Uh, nope. Right. One last attempt. A miss. Right. Yep. Great start. We suck a Kadja to raise our accuracy and evasion, and from that point, we mostly just spam bash, which they're weak to. Their damage is manageable so long as we keep our evasion raised at all times. Somehow, after five minutes, the last one goes down and we're awarded with three Mazio gems to dish out electrical damage, as well as two chewing souls for SP regeneration. Nice! That's great. Okay, let's see how we fare against the floor 14 Rampage Drive mini boss. Surprisingly, this was a much easier fight because despite the physical resistances, it's neutral to wind, and with our wind braces accessory boosting our Garu damage, we're hitting for over 50 damage! After just two minutes, it's job done. Barms of life are useless to us, but this Soma will come in very handy at some point. We've now gotten as far up the tower as we can, but there's still one thing we need to do before we can leave. Got one. Right. Come on. Come on. Yes! Let's go! Woo! Oh yeah! Who's laughing now, you golden git? <laughs> It's the 9th of May, meaning a full moon and time for our first main story boss fight. We're asked to find a big shadow above this monorail alongside Junpei and Yukari, who, again, we just keep using guard. 
The regular noob enemies are just pushovers, but we're soon against the clock before the train crashes. Here's our setup going into the Priestess boss fight. We're level 16 with Angel at 12 and our equipment is the same as before. Let's go. The fight begins and we kick things off with a Garu for a respectable 70 damage. It summons in two friends, but we should be able to just ignore them, right? Well, our second Garu drops the boss to around half HP, but then we get knocked down with a crit. Slash to make us dizzy, which forces us to skip our next turn, and we're soon dead to another critical before we have a chance to react. Yes. On the second attempt, we try to make use of the damage dealing items in our inventory for big AoE damage, but the small shadow on the right just keeps healing itself and the boss. After a couple of minutes of back and forth, the left shadow has respawned and it's obvious we're getting nowhere. We need to go all in on the boss herself and ignore the two smaller enemies. We get hit by a Palimpa, meaning we can't summon our Persona anymore, followed by... Oh, another Palimpa. Haha, <laughs> yep, she's stupid, she's dead. Nice, that's 243 XP in the bag. Phew, you got me fired up too. We reward ourselves with a Garu set, which comes with a Zeo skill card, so we will have extra type coverage. Hey, ever notice how Jumpy calls you man and dude even when you're playing as a girl? Is this deliberate, do you think? Or was it just too big of a job to change all those voice lines? Hmm. After exam season, we have a chat with our friendly neighborhood director advisor guy. Would we feel more assured if we had more team members? Hmm, nah, it's okay, we got this. Back in Tartarus, we get a painful reminder of Angel's weakness to dark, losing us almost half an hour of grinding. Ugh. We equip Zeo, collect the exam reward from Mitsuru, which grants Angel some nice stat bonuses, teach quest reward Meragi to Angel so we have a fire skill and fail to afford to buy a coffee because we only have 12 yen. By the way, we now have a coffee account if you want to drop us a tip, hashtag shameless plug. And it's time for the second main story boss, or rather, boss duo. The Empress on the left is weak to physical, whereas the Emperor on the right is weak to magic, though their weaknesses rotate and randomise as the fight goes on. We're forced to have teammates, so as always we keep them guarding. We're doing a fair bit of damage, but before long we're distressed and at low health. It's one of those lose-lose situations, because if we cure the distress, we'll still be on low health, whereas if we heal up, we're almost certain to be taken down by a crit, which is basically what you'd call a technical in Persona 5. We go for the heal option, but yeah, feels bad. A similar thing happens in the second attempt. We're inflicted with fear this time, and then the Emperor comes out for the knockdown and deals massive damage, wiping us out. Third attempt, and it's worth remembering that there's a 10 minute dungeon crawling section before this fight, which I'm having to replay every time I die. Ugh. It's not like we can just jump back in. Oh no. This is maniac difficulty after all. Ugh, dead again. Fourth attempt, and we go for some huge early damage. We decline the all out attack, obviously, and elemental affinities continue to change. Our final ally falls, but is closely followed by the Emperor. It's now a 1v1 against the Empress. We play things slowly and safely here because we can't afford to take any risks. After four and a half minutes, she's down to a Zeo. Job done. Good work, you should take the lead more often. Back in school, we grab a MacGuffin from the lab and take it to the Velvet Room. For this tiny amount of effort, we're awarded with the Beam Naganata, a completely overpowered weapon with 100 damage, super high accuracy, and a chance of inflicting panic on enemies whenever they get hit, which prevents them from using any skills. Nice. After more awkward dates with Theodore, the antique store finally opens. Woohoo! Heck yeah! This place stocks tons of powerful items, skill cards, and stat enhancements in exchange for rare gems. We need to be on the lookout for Onyx gems specifically, as these are the ones required for the items that will raise Angel's stats. We teach Angel Auto Tarakaja, granting us a nice damage boost for the first three turns of every fight. This will make farming so much easier. We try the floor 25 crying table mini boss mob, but as always, we get completely obliterated. Like, it's not even close. It's time to grind some more. 
Thankfully, most of the enemies here aren't too tough, but they're giving measly XP. Hey, is this weapon meant to sound like a lightsaber? You're starting to look exhausted. Alright, calm down. The game asks us if we want to replace Patra with a random skill. Alright, sure, let's roll the dice. Oh, Magaru, nice. For those unaware, this is just our wind skill, Garu, but it hits all enemies instead of just one. We use this to get the advantage against those crying tables. It's a tough fight, but it's over in just a couple of minutes. Another B chain reward. Surprisingly, the Change Relic miniboss on floor 36 is a complete pushover. It's immune to wind, so we just spam normal physical attacks until it drops. Within 90 seconds, it's dead and we've grabbed our loot. Nice! Alright, let's carry this momentum to the Floor 47 Golden Beetles. They're resistant to physical but weak against electric. Not that it matters because we're dead in under a minute. On the second attempt, we get super close before being kill rushed out of there. Third attempt, eh, dead to a pierce attack. Ah, sod it, we'll come back later. We start a social link with the world's best voice actress. My parents have an inferiority complex because all my relatives are doctors. Buy even more stat enhancements from the antique shop and... <laughs> Wait, what the hell is this guy's face? <laughs> Alright, he's getting added to the list. We max out Junpei's magician social link and try to get past these zombies and into the bar. Uh, sorry, excuse me, coming through, sorry. We teach Angel Regenerate 3 from the antique shop, which means we will now passively heal ourselves every turn, but we're still getting battered by these bloody beetles. Many attempts later, and we finally have this run. We keep our evasion buffed as much as possible and push the offensive. A strong Magaru, and we're wiping all out. Nice! Wait, two chewing souls? Are you freaking kidding me? Here's a quick update before we try fighting the next mini boss. We've temporarily equipped the Mega Luck Band because the upcoming Intrepid Knight drains wind skills, so Garu will be useless. Hopefully, this will allow us to hit some tasty criticals. Angel is level 25 and looking much stronger now, though her offensive stats are still kinda low. Things start out well, but we're soon panicked and kill rushed out of there. That damn kill rush skill, honestly, it's absolutely brutal. <laughs> Second attempt, and guess what we die to? Yep, another kill rush. Boo! Third attempt, and his counter strike is reflecting a lot of our attacks back at us, which is a constant panic risk due to our weapon's chance of inflicting it. We just keep healing up and dealing chip damage when we can. After 12 minutes, it finally falls. We do get rewarded with a Soma and a couple of Megiddo gems though, which is good compensation. At this point, we start rescuing people found on certain floors in Tartarus, which offer us decent rewards back at the police station. More stat upgrades for Angel, and then we go up these stairs and... Uh, wait, wait, what? We can't move. Yep, I'm pressing everything here and nothing is happening. Notice how the floor number also hasn't appeared at the bottom left corner? Fuka is meant to say a voice line here too, but it's glitched out. <sighs> Damn it, that was a lot of progress lost. Great remaster, Atlas. Anyway, it's time for the next full moon. Yukari can't be removed and we're not allowed to leave until we have a full party, which is kind of annoying, but we'll just keep them guarding as usual. The first of two bosses is the Hierophant, who is, yeah, like, how would you even begin to describe how this guy looks? <laughs> Well, within just a couple of minutes, all teammates are dead and we're constantly being inflicted with fear from his Prophecy of Ruin skill, resulting in nasty criticals. Thankfully, Regenerate 3 keeps topping up our health even when we're forced to miss turns. The tables soon turn though because after 6 minutes, we critical him down and follow up for massive damage. Sit down. After breaking the two fake mirrors in the hotel rooms, we're on to the second boss fight of the night, the Lovers. Here's our setup going in for those who are interested. Let's go. I was super nervous going into this fight because a death here would mean having to restart the entire night, including having to go through that Hierophant boss again. 
To make matters worse, this boss deals significantly more damage than the last one and can inflict charm through Marin Karen and other skills. I mean, look at this. It's crazy. We have to kill this thing quick before it takes us out. Thankfully, it wastes a turn on a spirit drain, so we run in for massive damage. Let's go. Damn, that was intense. It seems like we're getting stronger though, because we beat both of those bosses on our first try, whereas previous main story bosses have taken several attempts. Awesome! Some of our social links are now high enough that simply fusing a persona of the Arcana just gives enough XP to give us the skill card gift. This is why we're still leveling up social links, because some of these cards will be almost essential later in the run. We wake up in the middle of the night to find this Hello. creep stood there, like jeez, that's horrifying. And we ask Junpei for his thoughts about today's challenge run. It's totally amazing, huh? Man, this is so awesome! I'm not even kidding! After relaxing at the beach, we go for an all-out attack. Whoa, 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 time out! I seriously can't take much more of this! And gain this game's only social link buff, allowing teammates to take mortal blows for us. Sadly, this will of course be useless in this run. We go through the Persona 4 easter egg content with Yukiko and the Amagi Inn, and it's time for mini boss number 8, a trio of furious Gigas. Gigas's. Gigai. Uh, whatever. They're weak to win, so you'd think this would be an easy fight, but they hit hard, have good evasion, and a very high health pool. We get some unlucky misses towards the end, but they're still dead after 5 minutes. Next up, Fanatic Tower, which doesn't have any weaknesses. It fires weird combinations of powered up electric attacks as well as poison skills. We still have really low damage output, so this one takes another 5 minutes to take down. The Magic Mirror and Homunculus rewards are very nice though. Time for the next full moon boss. Full disclaimer, some of our party members levelled up from a random encounter here despite them only guarding. This doesn't break any rules, but I just thought it was worth mentioning. The boss is a huge tank thing, which looks hilarious. It's not long before the thing splits into two, Justice and Chariot. While the fight plays out, I'd like to discuss the recent rumours of a full Persona 3 remake. If it's true, this would explain why Atlas only remastered the portable version in this game instead of the full Fez version. Or maybe it was a popularity thing? Anyway, I think full moon locations like this military base could be fleshed out into huge explorable areas, kinda like the palaces in Persona 5. Then they could add maybe more fun mechanics to Tartarus to make it less grindy, kinda like how they added the stars and the flowers into Mementos in P5 Royal. Hmm. What do you think? Are you glad Portable got remastered, or would you have preferred the Fez version of P3? I'd like to read everyone's thoughts in the comment section. You might have noticed that I do like to respond to as many comments as I can down there. I've read every single comment in the challenge run so far, and responded to at least 90% of them. Thanks for all the nice messages, by the way. At first I was really nervous about reading the comments, since I thought it'd just be full of toxic people, but actually 99% of the messages are either really encouraging or really insightful. Cheers, guys. Anyway, that's 3334 XP in the bag. Amazing! Keep going! Here are some funny rip-off brand names. Hang on, Mooncist? Um, what? Like, I understand Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew, but what's Mooncist supposed to be? Anyone? I feel like I'm missing something obvious here. <laughs> we max out Tower Social Link, start a social link with Koromaru. Oh my god, you get to have a social link with a dog, that is awesome. Take the dog to the cinema, somehow, and it's time for the 10th mini boss. Three magical magus. Maguses. Magi. I have no idea. Anyway, their strong ice attacks overwhelm us on the first attempt, and on our second attempt, they get us down to 24 health, but we just keep exploiting their fire weakness. Job done. Next up is Natural Dancer, who blocks wind, which is kind of unfortunate. It loves inflicting charm, that status element that causes us to lose turns and even attack teammates if we had any. Needless to say, attempt number one goes badly. Attempt two, and after some bad counter luck, it's another death. Maybe we should leave this one for now. 
After we listen to the most obnoxious opening to a song ever, we're back at level 45 with Angel of 37. This giga look band might just be enough to tip the fight in our favour. It pays off as we don't get charmed quite as often and despite bad counter luck, the thing falls to a critical in under 3 minutes. The loot from this one was actually pretty good too. Now we have a choice, the game gives us the opportunity to change Bash into another random skill. You know what, sure, let's roll the dice. Secunda, uh, that's pretty bad. <laughs> We're back at the bloody mall for the next full moon boss. This is the hermit one and it mostly just spams electric moves. Sometimes it wastes three turns charging up a giga spark which deals mad, just kidding, it's totally crap. Just guard it and it barely takes off a third of your health. In only five minutes the boss falls. Definitely the easiest full moon boss in the entire game. We grab growth skill cards from the antique shop so we can keep levelling up other personas alongside Angel without ever equipping them. We spend time with Shinji, keep studying, get drenched in a typhoon and spend three days stuck in bed with a flu. Then it's more TV shopping, fusing a Seiyu and giving it growth 1 so we can eventually get its powerful Magarula skill card, whereas fusing the tower Eligor already gives us enough of a boost to grab its Miragilau skill card for free. Nice! For those unaware, these are just more powerful AoE versions of wind and fire elemental attacks. We can now get skill cards and pretty much any persona now. Alright, time for the first mini boss of the fourth block, 3 arcane turrets. These guys have tons of resistances and deal massive damage, completely deleting us on their first turn. Wow. The second attempt is going well until it's barbecue time. On the third attempt we keep dishing out ice damage via items and Angel's Mabufu skill, but these guys are really <coughs> tanky. <laughs> Sorry, I, I really couldn't help myself. It helps that one of them is tired at a different time to the other two because it means the incoming damage is more evenly spread out. They're down after just a couple of minutes. Next up, the Magician's Sleeping Table. It doesn't have any weaknesses but it's neutral to win so we just spam Garu skills. Surprisingly it falls in just over a minute, probably the fastest mini boss so far. Time for the monthly full moon boss. As always, we're forced to take party members with us, so we just grab a few weak ones and head on in. On the first attempt, we do rubbish with the roulette thingy and strength soon punishes us for having a status ailment. Attempt 2 ends in pretty much the same way. Finally, on attempt number 3, we've now got the hang of this roulette wheel. The trick is to stop it when it's roughly 180 degrees opposite the thing you want it to land on. Firstly, we want to be inflicted with rage because this will give us double the amount of turns and massively boost our damage output. It only affects Charlie because the other three are guarding but alongside some other rather skillful roulette timing, strength is down to about 20% HP within just a few turns. Wow! If you're someone who struggles with the wheel timing, one thing that worked for me was to stop watching the very bottom of the wheel where the pointer is. Instead, follow the part that you want around the wheel with your eyes, if that makes sense. There's no rush, just press it when you're feeling confident. After Strength dies, the solo battle against Fortune is mostly just a bit of fun. Like, I don't think he's ever going to be able to defeat you here unless you get red on every spin. It just takes a while. A total of 7 minutes for 7k XP. Job done. Looks like you're on point. Splendid. Time to duplicate our Growth 2 skill card at the shrine. It's just a shame that this game doesn't let you select which skill card you'd like duplicated and instead it just guesses randomly based on skill cards that you have in your inventory. No, not that one. Or oh, that one. Or oh, that one. Come on, Growth 2, come on. <clears throat> come on. Please choose Growth 2. Please. <sighs> Right, what is going on with this stupid piece of sh**? We finally duplicate Growth 2, keep playing games at the arcade to raise Angel stats and it's time for mini boss 14, Hell Knights. They're resistant to elemental magic so we just go for basic attacks. Not particularly easy or difficult but they do drop some nice Queen of Swords stat boosting items for Angel. Awesome. 
Mystical Gigas next, who reflects strike damage, meaning our weapon is useless. It can hit hard, but has pretty poor accuracy, so it's just a two minute wind spam until we grab its King of Wands for more luck and magic stat buffs. NANI?! <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I couldn't resist. <laughs> Fusing a Baden here and levelling up with Growth 2 will eventually grant us the Absorb Strike skill card, which will be almost essential for a certain upcoming boss. This heart icon also means it has an accessory for us named Tome of the Void, which is incredibly overpowered, but more on that a bit later. After more antique store visits, Fuka's second awakening, receiving a boatload of stat boosting exam reward items from Mitsuru, we make endless visits to the faculty office until we're given an overpowered maid outfit, only for it to be replaced by this crazy powerful final armour from the police station which gives plus one to all stats. Nice! While we're there, this shameless self-promoting atlas stick is insanely overpowered and a massive upgrade over our existing weapon. Oh, there's that skill card from Abaddon. No jump scare this time, don't worry. <laughs> We teach it to Angel and wow, check out her stats now. I genuinely hadn't checked this in quite a while, but we now have maxed out agility and luck and magic is close behind. I'm still nervous about that low endurance stat though because that affects how much damage we take and it can't be raised at the arcade like other stats can. Time for November's full moon boss. Here's our setup going in for those who are interested. Before we can get to the actual boss though, we're challenged by Edgelord Takaya and Cool Trainer Jin. Thankfully it just takes a few Magarulas and a flashy critical to wipe them out. Job done. Time for the main event, the Hanged Man Boss Shadow. For anyone who doesn't know or needs a refresher, you cannot target the Hanged Man until you destroy the three statues beneath it, which all have varying elemental resistances. But thankfully none of them are resistant to wind, which is why we're boosting that particular element. Once he falls, we have about one to three turns to dish out the pain before he summons more statues so he can start floating again. During this downtime, he either spawns in extra little guys or uses a crazy powerful strike attack called Akasha Arts, which has a crazy high crit chance and can easily wipe us out. But that is exactly why we spend so much time farming that Absorb Strike skill card from the Jump Scare Persona before we came here. Because of our excellent preparation, we just spent 10 minutes against one of the game's toughest bosses and didn't take a single point of damage. <laughs> After some spoilery spoileries, what the hell? We max out the bestest boy social link, go on a school trip. <laughs> Damn, Atlas, this the blurriness is destroying my eyes. And we're fighting Chidori. I thought there may be some challenge here because she regens HP, but we're dealing massive damage so it's over in just a few turns. We fuse a Loki with a Sopana to create Gabriel, who will eventually gift us with a Repel Dark skill card, patching up Angel's only weakness. And the grind continues. I've deliberately cut out most of the footage of me just farming enemies because it's pretty boring to see and I'm trying to make this video entertaining to watch. But rest assured that the overwhelming majority of time spent in this game was just me grinding XP while listening to YouTube in the background. Judgment Swords are next and it's just a Magarula spam for massive damage. The battle's over in just 30 seconds. Wow! We switch things up for these stasis giants though. Because of their strike and wind resistances, we go all in on ice damage. Nothing to write home about, it's over in just one minute and we hit level 77. We grab Garadine from Pazuzu, more on that later, and here's our setup going into the 18th mini boss fight. Angel now has max stats except for endurance and we're rocking some nice endgame gear. Phantom King just spams light instakill attacks which we're resistant to and some basic almighty skills. Meanwhile we're dealing, all together now, MASSIVE DAMAGE! Okay, I'm really sorry to that one guy who said the catchphrase got old really quickly. 
<laughs> if you're still with us, Jay, like, really appreciate you soldiering on through that. <laughs> The Royal Dancers love to spam various negative status ailments, but we're still absorbing their heat waves, so it's just a matter of time. Thankfully, we get hit by panic. This stops us from summoning our persona for a while, but prevents us from receiving all other ailments, since you can only be inflicted by one at a time. Job done. We switch up the Berserker's seal accessory for the Reckoning Dice mini-boss, since it blocks all magics and therefore we're going all in with physical attacks. By the time the fight intro played out, this was a 19 second fight, one of, if not the quickest so far. We grab the old document and that's as far as we can go up the tower for now. We have literally nothing left to do, so we commit the persona sin of wasting our evenings by going to bed early and even wasting day times by returning to the dorm without doing anything. We spend Christmas Day at school. Oh, that's really sad. Max out Judgment and enter January, the final month of the game. There are no TV purchases from this point on, so let's just go make some more progress through Tartarus. We're in the final block now, and Miniboss 21 is a pretty tough mob. They have a lot of HP and deal a good amount of damage. We use Cadenza items to try to keep on top of the healing while also boosting our evasion. Then just keep spamming auto basic attacks, hoping for a critical. I mean, we are getting stronger, but... The enemy is getting stronger too. Yep, very true. Thankfully, regular mobs are still as weak as ever. We spend another IRL evening farming enemies and Angel levels up enough to finally reach max stats. Nice! This Carnal Snake's mini-boss mob should just be another walk in the park. Wait, wait, what? Wow, okay, we really need that Repel Dark skill card. Hey, Gabriel, do you have it ready for us yet? Oh, cheers, thanks. Now this is finally looking like a true endgame persona. Needless to say, we wipe the floor with the Carnal Snakes on the second attempt and the following world balance, despite being beefier, falls just as easily. We're making an absolute beeline for the top floor now, wiping out these fierce Cyclops noobs in seconds. The problem is that the upcoming final mini-boss, Jordan of Grief, drains pretty much all damage, so we need to switch things up fast. We fuse a Loki with a Thoth to create Neberos, and we quickly grab its Megiddo skill card, which is an almighty attack and therefore cannot be blocked. Armed with this new skill, we start the fight. Megiddo uses up tons of SP, and the boss is an absolute tank with a huge health pool. To make matters worse, it's regularly inflicting rage, causing us to heal it. We're at a complete stalemate, so I just reset the game. Second attempt, and we equip our Tome of the Void accessory to reduce the chance of being inflicted with status ailments. This is a tough fight, but it's the last obstacle blocking our path to the final boss, and we can't give up now. We're out of SP, but a Megiddo gem item seals the deal. Congratulations if you made it this far into the video. All mini-bosses are dead, and we'll soon be reaching the final story boss. We fuse Attis, who soon coughs up an Enduring Soul skill card, allowing us to come back from the dead of full HP once per battle. It seems like this will be essential for the final boss. We quickly reach level 99, which honestly isn't too grindy because XP is shared between teammates in this game, so fighting alone actually makes it much quicker to level up. As a result, we're at 999 HP and SP. Asura gives us Unshaken Will for more protection from status ailments, then we use a Kakuri Hime and Vishnu to create Kartikeya, whose name I hope I'm pronouncing properly, but I'm probably not. <laughs> she can be itemised into a Vel Vel Maruga, arguably the best weapon in the game for the female protagonist. After maxing out the last of the social links, we return two days later to pick it up and immediately equip it. I mean, look at this difference, wow! We try to fuse a Loki for a request mission, only to accidentally create the most powerful persona in the game. Go to bed early, and we are here. The 31st of January. Today is the promised day. Oh my god! We delete all of the personas, and here's our setup going into the final stretch of Tartarus. We're level 99 with Angel at 83, and have the Vayu Braces accessory equipped to act as a wind amp. 
In terms of skills, we're going for a wind boosted Garadine, which yes, does stack with our wind amp accessory. Weapons Master will also double the damage of our basic weapon attacks. Despite our immense power, Golden Hands are still escaping from us. <laughs> but you know what? We're over that now. We found our peace. Fare thee well, my cherished golden friend. Against the regular endgame enemies though, well... <laughs> Before heading into the final boss, here's the footage of the optional Reaper super boss fight. It was surprisingly much easier than I thought. He deals a good amount of damage, but wastes a lot of time getting dark insta-kills reflected back at him. He's dead in just two minutes. Honestly, that final mini-boss earlier, Jordan of Grief, was probably more challenging than the Reaper. A reminder that for main story bosses, we're forced to have teammates, so we just pick some weak ones and keep wasting their turns with guard. Alright, here we go, people. Jin's back and he wants your Pikachu. But after some awesome physical strikes, it looks like he's blasting off again. Edgelord Takaya is more tanky and deals good damage, especially with his Mega Delaon skill. But after less than three minutes, he's back to starfishing. Um, are you are you okay down there? <laughs> Bruh. Final boss spoiler warning. This is it, everyone. Everything we've done has led up to this moment. Nick's avatar and its insanely huge sword. I've seen arguments online about whether Nick's avatar is male or female because Nyx itself is female, but the avatar came from a certain male character in the game. Eh, I'll just say it and you can all fight it out in the comments section. Anyway, it just stares at us until we hit it a couple of times to trigger the first damage dealing form, the Magician. At this point we just guard and wait for all teammates to die in order to make this a true solo run. Nyx dishes out fire and almighty damage in this phase, but our high endurance stat means we're not taking much damage yet. Yet. On to the Priestess Arcana, and it's now ice damage that we have to worry about. Thankfully we're evading well and we're soon taking wind damage from the Empress form. We're still dealing about a thousand damage per turn and even its lightning emperor form isn't particularly threatening. A reminder that sadly criticals do not offer us any extra turns in this fight, as Nick's avatar cannot be knocked down. It switches over to Hierophant and this is where things start to get interesting. With its boosted crit rate it easily knocks us down and follows up with more physical attacks for some good damage, but not good enough. Onto the lovers, it desperately tries to charm us with holy arrows during this phase, but our unshaken will passive skill is having none of it. Onto the chariot, funnily enough it charges up and repeatedly spams God's hand which heals us, <laughs> thank you kindly. Justice now which is all about insta kill light attacks which we are resistant to. We also have several homunculus items in our inventory that can easily tank these kind of skills anyway, should the worst happen. We lazily leave it on auto attack and begin laughing at how pathetically easy this boss is. Over to Hermit, we're repelling the dark insta kill attacks and even with foul breath boosting our ailment susceptibility, the poison fails to connect, as does the panic from Tentarafu. It shifts to fortune and starts desperately spamming various elemental magics, none of which we're resistant or weak to. Over to strength and I'm starting to feel like this fight couldn't get any easier. Until... Oh, oh wow, alright. Go on Nyx, try your hardest. Oh wow, it's really going all out. Actually got us below half health for a second there. But we get back up and Garadine the thing. While the hanged man portion plays out, I just want to say that so far we're poking fun at this boss, but honestly I really love Nick's avatar. It's such a well designed boss with strong thematic phases that really lean into the tarot arcana theme that runs through the veins of these games. It's also visually stunning for a PS2 PSP game and it has an amazing soundtrack. Love it! It switches to death, its final phase granting it access to a much wider move pool, resistance to all elements and 6000 HP. Both of us are absolute bullet sponges, so this is just a true battle of attrition. Moonless Gown temporarily prevents us from dealing any damage, so we just use these turns to cleanse debuffs, nullify status ailments or just heal up a bit. This is a really interesting battle mechanic that gives the fight a sort of back and forth flow to it. 
It does use its most powerful skill, Night Queen, a couple of times, which has a chance of inflicting various negative status ailments, but again, Unshaken Will saves us from them. A few minutes later, a final Garadine finishes it off. The moon opens up, so we fly off into outer space, become invincible through the power of friendship, and launch a great seal at Nyx, completing the run. Can you beat Persona 3 Portable solo using only Angel on the hardest difficulty? Yep, certainly can. That was another really interesting run with fun difficulty spikes. I just kind of wish the final boss was a bit more difficult, like what we saw in Persona 4 and 5. Feel free to check out our past challenge runs if you're wanting something else to watch. Meanwhile, I've beaten this remaster as both the male and female protagonists now, so... WHERE THE HELL IS MY TROPHY?! <laughs> All right, see you later, everyone. Cheers. Wow, we managed to do the full video without once mentioning Angel's appearance. Jesus Christ, Atlas. Hey, Senpai, if you enjoyed this video, then why not give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more Persona challenges. See you next time.